What happens when passion meets unending opportunities? When a chance is provided to pursue a dream? In America, the African diaspora are marrying ambition and opportunity and creating a standard of emergence and success in various industries. These individuals are setting a precedent in their pursuits. Hi, I'm Kali Ujugu and this is The Benchmark. Welcome to The Benchmark. I'm Kali Ujugu, and today we have the political director for Organizing for America, Johannes Abraham. Thanks so much for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me. If we could begin, um, where did where did you see the, the interest in politics burgeon? Did you have an interest growing up, or was it something that incited in high school or undergrad? You know, it, it's something that I think has been a part of my being my consciousness for for a long time. I, my parents are uh, have always been uh, very politically active and very politically aware, and raised my sister and I uh, in that environment. Uh, we've been strong Democrats from the time I can remember. Uh, literally, it's you know uh, one of the first memories I have uh, is watching election night returns with my my parents. Uh, I didn't you know I, when I was younger, I wasn't entirely sure if that's something I wanted to go into. Uh, like many Ethiopian American kids, being a doctor was the first thing that oh, was yeah. that was posed to me as oh, yeah. as a boy. But uh, you know, as as I began to get older and I went through school and I had some opportunities to work on campaigns and to work uh, on the Hill, uh, it really kind of sharpened my you know my my sense of purpose around uh, the mission of public service. So for undergrad, you went to Yale. I went to Yale, and you studied political science, yes. right? So was that all sort of leading up to? you know, the career that you have now? You know, it, it was not, uh, I'd say no. I think it was part of the same trajectory uh, that I'd been on uh, in my entire life, but I certainly didn't enter college knowing that I wanted okay. to work on a presidential campaign or that I wanted to work even in D.C. I, I think like every college student I had, you know, my freshman year I had a hundred different things I wanted to do. I thought I might want to be a screenwriter at one point. Um, you know, I thought I might want to be an economist at one point. Um, what I found incredibly valuable, really even more so than the coursework, my coursework was, was, was incredibly fascinating um, and, and enlightening, but in terms, of, uh, in terms of clarifying in my own mind what I wanted to do, what I found very helpful were the work experiences I was able to acquire uh, working on a couple of campaigns uh, during my time in college um, and having a chance to intern on the Hill. Um, those really helped uh, give me a sense of what I might enjoy doing after school. But really, most importantly, uh, the, the, the single most important variable uh, that caused me to, to be on the career path I am now uh, was then Senator Obama's entry into the, the presidential contest. So as soon as you graduated, you joined President yes. Obama's campaign. Yes, Could I, you tell us about that, what that was like? How'd you begin? It, it was an amazing experience. Uh, anybody who ever has a chance, who's interested in politics, who has a chance to work in the Iowa caucuses, first in the nation uh, primary contest, right. uh, it's a, it's a, just a once in a lifetime experience. Um, and, and working for him uh, went back when you know the staff was quite small, and, and as he traveled around the state, uh, you know he would do many small events. It's, it's funny now, you know he packs tens of thousands of people uh, into uh, hear him speak. Uh, I remember building for events uh, in the Iowa caucus where there'd be 150 people there, there'd be 55 people there, there'd right. be 300 people there. I remember feeling like we got a huge crowd once when we got 1,000 people there. So that sort of grassroots, uh, being able to see him operate in that grassroots uh, environment and that retail environment uh, was, really was a privilege. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. So essentially, why did you end up choosing to join President Obama's campaign trail, and maybe not Hillary Clinton. What? Well, you know, it, it's a good question. The the first thing I'd say is I'm a huge fan of Secretary Clinton. Uh, I have been really my entire life. My family's huge fans of the Clintons uh, throughout their time in office and, and afterwards. Um, but I, I had a well. The, uh, taking a step back, I'll say this: when President Obama first sort of was a appeared on the national scene, uh, even before the convention speech, this sort of sent him into the atmosphere when right. it came to being a national figure. Um, I had an awareness of him. Uh, when he first, you know, it's hard to have a name like mine and <laughs> not notice a guy with a name like his right. uh, who's making waves. Uh, and there's definitely from day one, I, I had a sense of pride about what he was able to accomplish. I remember when he was, you know, still running in the Democratic primary to be uh, the junior senator from Illinois, uh, you know, before the 2004 uh, race that, that got him that seat. Uh, hearing his name pop up, and, and it really it piqued my interest. His biography piqued my interest, um, 
and caused me to dig a little bit more about him. Right. And um, as I did, really, and this was this was not a short. Uh, this wasn't a short exercise. It was over the course of months and even years. Really, everything I learned about him uh, when I read his first book, uh, you know, and when I hear him speak, and when I seek out opportunities to get his 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 uh, sense of the issues, uh, everything I, I learned about him from a policy perspective, and really from from getting a sense of him as a man as as well as you can from afar, uh, it just continued to to play into what I later realized was a growing sense of of mission at seeing him. Uh, one day lead this country because I had such a clear, uh, you know, and, and such a clear sense of how special a leader uh, he was and what he could potentially represent for this country. And, and uh, um, really, by the time he declared, it was no longer a decision. Right. Um, I knew if he was going to run for president, I was going to do everything I could to, to make that a reality. So, what was that like being on the ground and and? Um, rallying support um, because I think a lot of people don't realize how much work really goes into um, informing the public and really getting those votes so what did some of that entail? I'm a lifelong fan of the state of Iowa first of all and I'm gonna, I'm gonna reference that first I, I started in Iowa I was there for the duration of the caucus and then I went on to five other primary states and then I ended up in in Virginia for the general election where I'm from and I, I you know my Iowa and Virginia experiences are kind of the the benchmarks of my campaign experience. I value them both, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about them both. On the the Iowa experience was, you know, it was interesting at first. You know, that we take it for granted now. Now that he's president, it's kind of easy to forget that when he first entered the race. Oh yeah. Um, you know, you'd call someone and, and ask them their thoughts on Barack Obama. They say, "What's a Barack Obama?" And, you know, <laughs> and it was it was uh, he. You know, while he at that point was a national figure in politically aware circles, he wasn't a household name. Right. Uh, he wasn't someone that everybody uh, had a clear sense of. Uh, and so it was really interesting those early days. I mean, there was a lot of misconceptions out there about him. Oh yes. Um, and but. And how do you combat that? Because a lot of what was rolling around was, I mean, really was a lot of nonsense. Um, but a lot of it was were things that really you can only say no that's not true I mean how can you really you know you work to uh, what he was able to do is, is is one he's always combated those things but I think with a tremendous amount of class um, and two uh, he's been able to inspire a, a grassroots army uh, you know a huge grassroots network of volunteers uh, and that have been able I think to to push back against negative messaging and have been able to to really uh, educate the public on uh, both his policies and his biography as a person and that's that's something that uh, over the course of the time uh, our time in Iowa is he got to uh, you know keep in mind that that Iowa is a state that's 97 percent it's a 97 percent white state right uh, it wouldn't seem like a natural fit for candidate uh, Obama uh, back then um, but his ability to connect to people his ability to understand their uh, their their needs and their thoughts uh, and his ability to inspire them, you know, as we were able to spend more and more time in the state, that just became more and more apparent. The crowds grew bigger, uh, interest in him uh, grew bigger and bigger. Um, you know, answer the, your question a little bit more directly, I'm, I'm kind of talking about the highs. There's definitely lows. When I first hit the ground in Iowa, he was down 30 points nationally. Okay. And, you know, the narrative was that there was a front runner who was going to win and, and he had no chance. And, and you know, the, the initial narratives was, was he playing for vice president? Um, and what I also found, you know, just to draw another lesson about him as a leader, was that uh, he was always able throughout the course of the campaign, uh, one, to put a leadership team in place uh, that kept everybody on track and kept everybody's eye on the ball. But more importantly, him as the ultimate leader of the campaign was able to uh, really effectively keep the staff and the supporters uh, positive and upbeat during the tough times and, and uh, with a real sense of faith in the game plan uh, that had been laid out, and it, it led us to be successful in Iowa, which laid the, the groundwork for his ultimate victory in the primary. So as soon as uh, President Obama was elected, um, you became the assistant to the deputy director of legislative affairs, as, right? Yeah, legislative assistant. Okay. So what, what did that entail? Because I'm, I'm sure as soon as he was elected, I, I mean, not only was, was there a rush, but an immediately a new position. So what, did, what was you know, that it's like? A, the first couple of days uh, at any White House are hectic. You know, you're, you're, everybody's getting acclimated to their new jobs. It's one of the few places on earth where the, va you know, when there's a transition, it's a full transition. It's almost an entire transition uh, of staff. Um, so, the, you know, the, those first couple of days were definitely hectic and they were, they were, they were action-packed. In terms of what the Office of Legislative Affairs does, 
Uh, it's the president's primary link between uh, himself and his administration and Congress. Uh, I work specifically on the, the House team, uh, which okay. liaises with the House of Representatives. Uh, and my boss was uh, and is still the president's primary link to the, the my old boss, the president's primary link to the U.S. House of Representatives. So, you know, the, the office's uh, duties range from sort of the mundane, just making sure that there's an open line of communication for simple requests, day to day requests, to um, you know, Phil Shalero, who runs the office, is, is one of the president, the main architects of the president's legislative agenda, uh, and one of the main um, strategists around his legislative agenda. So, um, it, it was an extremely exciting time to work there, uh, working on the WHIP efforts around health care, um, around all of this, the great Wall Street reform, all the great accomplishments of the, the president's first term. Was that at all intimidating? Because I could, I don't know, for myself, I think getting into such a position as that at such a, an amazing time in history in America, being young um, and working alongside people who have decades underneath their belt, was that at all intimidating? You know, I, I don't know if intimidating is the right word. I think humbling is the right word. I think we all mm -hmm. had a very appropriate sense of, uh, you know, this president's time in history and the importance of the first two years in office and, and what we might be able to accomplish at the outset. Uh, and I think that extended from the, the you know, staffers of all ages, uh, had a really keen sense from day one, and I think this was driven by the president, of, of humility. Uh, and and uh, that was sort of married with uh, a lot of excitement about what we might be able to do. Um, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say intimidated. I had some absolutely fantastic uh, uh, mentors while in the White House uh, that continue to be mentors and that um, just cause it to be an, an amazing experience. So if we can discuss politics a little bit. Um, just yesterday, the House of Representatives voted to repeal uh, Obama's health care reform. And from my understanding, that's OFA's biggest platform or one of, one of the biggest issues that they're pushing. Why do you think there's so much contention um, between passing such, such, a land, such a big, big um, reform? Well, th this is what I'd say. First of all, uh, I'm going to take a step back and, and use this opportunity to uh, one of the things I'm most proud of working at OFA, uh, and I was actually at the White House during this time period, but one of OFA's uh, biggest accomplishments was the role it played in the passage of, of health reform. And I'm absolutely convinced that if it wasn't for the thousands and thousands of grassroots activists that worked with OFA, that health reform wouldn't be a reality now. Um, you know, speaking plainly, I think that uh, Republican leadership, um, you know, I, I think in a time when the country is, is faced with you know, myriad issues that we need to tackle. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, they seem intent on looking, looking backwards and looking in the past and uh, attacking what they see as the president's uh, one of the president's signature uh, pieces of uh, uh, signature accomplishments. Uh, and they're doing it to score political points. I don't think they see it as, um, you know, I don't think they see it as actually a legislative goal as so much as a political goal. Uh, and what we're doing here at OFA, uh, one is just making absolutely certain that we're holding them accountable uh, for the votes that they take. Uh, and making sure that we're continuing to educate the public about the benefits of reform, uh, and just the again the myriad ways in which reform helped the American healthcare reform has helped the American people and will continue to help the American people, and that's an argument we're going to win. So, would would you say that the healthcare reform has been the biggest challenge for organizing for America, or is yeah. there a new um, platform that you guys are looking to? What we're going to what we're going to continue to do, and, and healthcare reform is sort of you know as as the first. Uh, agenda item of the new Republican uh, uh, House, at least. Right. Um, you know, clearly that was sort of our, our first thing out of the gates this year. But we're going to continue to uh, uh, help the president pass legislation that's a priority to him, and defend the president's accomplishments, and just defend the really the the, the fantastic and uh, history-making progress that the president's been able to bring to this country. Uh, make sure we defend that, and make sure that we hold accountable uh, those who are who are seeking to roll that back. So as a political director here, could you take us on a typical day? Because I don't think maybe a lot of people understand what your position entails. So as soon as you get in here, how, how does a day typically look? You know, it, it, it sort of depends what time of year it is. Um, it was a different story as we were sort of more in electoral mode uh, in the months leading up to 2010. Uh, at that point, uh, I was constantly poring over uh, numbers as they were coming in and 
making sure I had an accurate sense of what was happening in the various races that we were watching, uh, making sure that I had an accurate sense of what our staff was doing in those races, and then really working hard to make sure that uh, we were working uh, as synergistically as possible with our various stakeholders on the ground uh, to be as impactful as possible. Uh, and OFA volunteers just, you know, in what was a difficult election, uh, were uh, truly a force and made uh, a historic amount of midterm election uh, voter contact attempts. Now that we're more, you know, that we're past the, that immediate electoral phase, um, sort of the core of the responsibility is making sure that we as an organization are working well with our various stakeholders. So that includes Democratic members of Congress, it includes uh, state parties, uh, it includes local elected and state elected officials, making sure that we're working as closely with them as possible uh, so that way we're all sort of rowing in the same direction and we're all working towards, uh, you know, our, our shared goals as Democrats. Uh, that's sort of the overarching. Uh, role of, of my job. So what would you say is the most challenging aspect as political director? You know, what I'd probably say is, is you know, the, the thing that, that's most difficult sometimes um, or, or most challenging. Um, Everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's a, it's a hard one because uh, you know, everything, everything takes a lot, a lot of work and, and takes a lot of effort, but there's no, there's no aspect of my job that I particularly dread. Okay. Yeah. So then what's the most rewarding? Thing? The most rewarding thing, I think, when we're, uh, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I think I felt uh, as gratified as I ever had been um, working for the president, and it's been some time now, uh, at the end of the lame duck session uh, that just ended, uh, and really seeing uh, the work that OFA did uh, and the work that Democrats did broadly and the work that the White House did uh, to pass just so many historic pieces of legislation, and, and the, the START Treaty, uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, um, to be able to extend unemployment benefits for 13 months. Um, just to, to, to see all of those, those things come together uh, was incredibly gratifying. And then actually, I'll say this, going back to the difficult question, I think the difficult question, frankly, the difficult piece of the job is uh, I, I have such faith in the president as a man and a leader uh, and such a loyalty to him. Um, that, you know, at times it's hard to see some of the unfair criticism that gets lobbed uh, against him. Uh, and it's hard to, to sort of brush that off and not let it affect you, but it's just something that, that you have to do. So a lot of Ethiopians here in America are very leery of politics, um, whether it be because of experiences back mm -hmm. home or their own beliefs here. What's been the, the family reception to your political pursuits? Well, I, I'll say my, my parents are strong Democrats uh, and, and have been for a while. They were never as active as they, they are now, um, but the reception has been in incredibly favorable. Uh, my, my parents and sister volunteered all over the country when I was uh, working for the president. Um, I don't know how much of it was an excuse to see me and how much of it was, <laughs> it was actually for his benefit. I imagine there, there was a, a, some mix. But I think like a lot of Ethiopian Americans, my, my, my entire family feels a great sense of pride in the accomplishments that the president's been able to oh, achieve. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's sort of gone hand in hand with a, a, a real excitement about the um, role I've been you know, fortunate enough to play in that. And why do you think that is? Because I think a lot of immigrants, especially uh, Im Africans in the diaspora, mm -hmm. really feel something that resonates with the president, and do you think that has to do with his own yeah. his own yeah. background? I think it does, and I think you know I'd extend it more broadly. Uh, I certainly think that, that immigrants uh, and the, the children of immigrants in this country feel a special connection to the president, but I also think that a lot of groups that that maybe historically have been marginalized in this country or historically have not necessarily felt uh, the promise of all that is good in this country uh, see in the president an embodiment of, of of that promise, and I think that a lot of us, and I certainly include myself in this category. Uh, as an African American, as an Ethiopian American, uh, feel a great sense of pride in living in a country uh, that that's capable of electing in its highest office uh, a man with an uncommon name uh, from a minority group. That's not something you see in many countries. That's not something. I, I mean, you, you could really name on just a couple of fingers the countries that are that are able to do that. And I think that uh, in the Ethiopian American community, that pride is, is tied to that. Uh, because if you can see a man named Barack Obama as president that looks like Barack Obama, you could easily see. Highlight Gebra Maryam <laughs> as president one day. You could easily see anybody from our community. One right, day. right. Well, as soon as the interview gets good, we, we have to cut to commercial break. Stay tuned, we'll be right back.